uh, honour and pleasure to uh, introduce the, uh, the president of the, the Flag Institute, uh, Captain uh, Malcolm Farrow, who will make the uh, formal welcome. Mr Chairman, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is a very great pleasure to see you all here today and, and thank you all for coming. Uh, a particular welcome to those of you who have travelled from far and wide, and some have, from a considerably far and wide. Australia springs to mind, the Czech Republic springs to mind, even as far as Portsmouth and Bristol. Uh, but uh, uh, wherever you've come from, and Scotland, uh, wherever you've come from, you're very welcome, and I hope, as uh, Jeff has already said, that we'll have a, a terrific day. A particular welcome also, but in advance, because he's not here yet, uh, to the first ever Secretary of State uh, we are, are having to one of our meetings. As you probably know already, the Secretary of State for the Department of Communities and Local Government, uh, Eric Pickles, and indeed his wife, uh, are coming later and will be making a, a, a presentation. So it's, it's terrific uh, for that to have happened, uh, and that is a really splendid uh, uh, move, move forward, and I hope it's the, the, the first of perhaps uh, many senior politicians. Also, as well, coming later, I hope, is uh, the chairman of the All-Party Flag and Heraldry Committee, Andrew Rossendale, who has been to one of our meetings before. So, uh, to both of them, in advance, a very welcome indeed. Uh, a thank you must uh, first go out, of course, to Charles Ashburn, standing at the door, uh, who has done the magnificent arrangements for this meeting, and without which uh, we would not be here at all. So, thank you, Charles, for a fantastic uh, show that you have put on for us. And, of course, thank you to the Naval Club, to John Sonderscoe, who some of you know and is walking around, and his splendid staff, who've made this wonderful facility available for us. Because uh, I think it's a, it's a lovely place to come, and I hope you will enjoy being here for that, as well as uh, for what we're about to tell you all about. So, that brings us to uh, you know, what have we been up to, and uh, what's been going on in the Institute, and in the flag world, uh, since we gathered here uh, before. An awful lot, actually. Uh, firstly, the Flag Institute has continued its very close association with the All-Party Flag and Heraldry Committee. Now, this is a committee which is perhaps not well known nationally, but it's becoming better known in the uh, corridors of Whitehall and Westminster. Uh, since uh, the committee, all, all members of both houses of uh, Parliament were issued with a copy of this booklet, and I'm sure you've all got one. There are some available if you haven't. Everybody in, in both Houses of Parliament got a copy of this uh, last year. And as a result, a very large number, 50, 60 or more, uh, MPs and Lords, assorted MPs and Lords, uh, expressed an interest to Andrew uh, Rossendale, the chairman, in joining the committee. Uh, and a lot of them did join. And so the Flag and Heraldry Committee, from a standing start about a year or two ago, now has membership at very senior level of well-known lords and MPs who have joined because they are interested in, in the whole business of national flags and use of flags nationwide. And this has got to be a good thing because quite a few of them are, are significant individuals like the former head of the civil service, like the most recent Knight of the Garter, people like that. And of course we have a now a permanent representation on that committee from the College of Arms. So flags, heraldry, very closely associated uh, are, are, are establishing a proper, a proper relationship once again. So that's terrific. The other notable success uh, it, it was a, an event held in the House of Lords uh, a couple of months ago to launch the permanent flying of the national flag from Victoria Tower above the House of Lords. Now that actually happened about a year ago, as I'm sure you know, the flag went up and stayed up about a year ago. Uh, but it does take time to organize events in the House of Lords, and so the, the launch event uh, actually happened a couple of months ago, to which a, a, a very wide range of seriously influential people came, not just from the Flag and Heraldry Committee, but from within uh, government circles uh, and uh, associated organizations. And so the whole word is spreading about uh, flags and, and what, what they can do, uh, and uh, that's got to be a good thing. But that was also organized by Charles Ashburn again most splendidly. So the Flag Institute has increased its uh, influence uh, and its uh, activity in the corridors of Westminster and Whitehall. And that's only one of the things that the Flag Institute does, of course, but it's an important one. And if we can uh, continue to do that, 
then the institute will become better known, better respected, and that has got to be good for all the other things we do. So there are, there were, nevertheless, many challenges uh, left, left for us. I mean, there will never be a lack of challenges, uh, but there are challenges both for our flags, and I'm talking about that nationally now, but also for our institute, which is, of course, international. So firstly, our flags. What are the challenges there, the main ones that sort of spring to mind? Perhaps the first one is that uh, the United Kingdom's national flag, the world-famous Union Jack, has no United Kingdom authority responsible for its governance uh, and uh, looking after it and managing it. None at all. Contrast that with Australia, for example, represented here, where the national symbols officer in the department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet has a very clear responsibility for Australia's national flag and its governance. No such thing happens here. That uh, is an issue which rises all the time in various guises uh, and uh, is manifested by various elements of mismanagement. And uh, there are lots of examples, and I won't try and go through them, but there are lots of examples where that is an unsatisfactory arrangement. The Flag and Heraldry Committee fully accepts it's an unsatisfactory arrangement, but it is an arrangement that's been around for hundreds of years, not going to be easy to change. But it does mean that people, including very senior people, still do not take appropriate care of their national flag uh, and look after it and treat it in a dignified uh, and proper way. This is evident all the time. It is often left to the security guard at the gate to look after it, and that's not good enough. There are still far too many filthy flags, tatty ones, not properly looked after, and even the day before the royal wedding in central London, there were a significant number of tatty flags around, despite the wonderful spread of, of absolutely splendid flags, which many of you would have seen on television or in, in person. There were still a lot of tatty ones around. And that includes government departments and the military establishment too. And it's clearly not good enough. It's completely unacceptable. Why is this? Well, one of the reasons might be that flags are not taught in the national curriculum. Children in our schools are not taught about their national flag, its history, uh, its background, why it's the funny shape it is, which way up to fly, what it means. They're not taught anything about this. And that would be a good place to start. And if the uh, Secretary of State for Education was here, I would like to think he might take note of that. And uh, I might like to think that when he is approached on this subject, he will take note of it. <coughs> there are opportunities being missed for nation building. Once again, Australia fully understands the concept of nation building in the light of uh, changes in demography, and this country needs to do that too. There are other opportunities that are being missed. The flags of Her Majesty's realms, and our head of state, Her Majesty the Queen, is not just the Queen of Little England, and not just the Queen of the United Kingdom. She's the Queen of quite a lot of places, and this is where she uh, lives and moves and has her being, and her realms are not represented. In anywhere in this nation, the flags of Her Majesty's realms, and there are quite a lot of them, 14, 15, Nick will correct me, about 15, uh, are not flying anywhere. And they should be, and the Flag and Heraldry Committee is very keen to try and overcome that and have the flags of Her Majesty's realms, the overseas territories, the crown dependencies, and the home nations flying somewhere in this country. Now, as you know, on uh, ceremonial occasions in London, the flags of the Commonwealth are flown, and that's terrific. We're all huge supporters of the Commonwealth. And that's very good indeed. But surely it should come first of all, the flags of the home nations should be flying, and then the flags of the Commonwealth. That is something the Flag and Heraldry Committee has very much in its mind. These matters, I think, do need to be addressed in the concept of uh, developing our understanding of our cultural background and our symbols of sovereignty, which are extremely important. Whatever, uh, whatever view you take of nationhood, symbols of sovereignty have got to be important. So, that's so much for flags, that's enough for that. What about the Institute? Well, on the one hand, the Institute uh, is doing very well indeed. And I've already illustrated the, uh, the way in which our influence is, is growing and people are taking more note of us. Uh, we feature, I think, in the Daily Express, even today, this meeting is mentioned. This is terrific. At the same time, there are new and younger, uh, I emphasize the word younger quite strongly, younger people coming uh, onto the council of the Institute uh, to take, uh, to take uh, various important functions and refresh our management. And that is a very good thing too, because for a long time, it was a lot of old stagers like me uh, who were, were, were appearing at every meeting and no one was coming along with fresh ideas and new blood was not appearing. And sooner or later, we are not going to be there. Uh, so we do need a, a, a sort of succession program. And that's beginning to happen. So that's very good indeed, very, very encouraging. That's excellent news. But on the other hand, and you can help with this, 
uh, all is not perhaps quite so well as we would like because our membership is not large enough. It's not large enough to support uh, a developing function of the Institute. Indeed, our membership did actually drop fractionally, generally through death of older members, uh, last year. It's now rather under 500. 500 worldwide membership is not enough uh, to support uh, what the Institute aspires to do, and perhaps more importantly, what the nation uh, is starting to think that we can do. As we uh, talk our way into this greater position of influence in Whitehall and Westminster, it's not unreasonable for people there to think that we have the resources to do this, to study that, to turn up at this meeting, to, to, to take on functions and tasks. Well, we don't, because we're all part-timers, either retired or fully employed, like most of us are, doing this in our spare time. We need more members so that we can uh, be better resourced. And I would ask you, when you go back to your constituencies, as it were, to encourage your friends and colleagues who are interested in flags, actually to join the Institute. Join it. Don't just uh, enjoy the flags and, and talk about them, but join the Institute. Put the money where the mouth is. But overall, I think we can most certainly be positive. Uh, there's been a huge increase, certainly in the United Kingdom, uh, in recent years, in the use of flags, in flying flags, and they are being flown better. There are fewer of them upside down. There are less of them quite so filthy as they were. People are taking more notice, whether that's because of devolution or the EU or football teams. It doesn't matter what the reason is. They are being flown uh, more than they were some years ago. So that's really enough for me. Uh, we've got a most interesting program developed by Charles and others for, for today. Uh, so let's get on and enjoy the program.